Hello and welcome to Planet Outlook. My guest today is Dr. Yashvir Bhatnagar. Dr. Bhatnagar is an award-winning wildlife scientist who has been working for the past three decades on high altitude landscapes and especially on a species which is very, very elusive. It's called the gray ghost. We are talking about the snow leopard and gradually we'll move on to other mountain ungulates with Yashvir. Thank you, Yashvir, for your time and joining us on Planet Outlook. Uh, thank you so much, Ananda. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here uh, in this forum. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I would like to start with with one of your old stories that you had written, uh, having lunch with the snow leopard. Now we all know that we hardly get to see the snow leopard if we are in Ladakh or in Spiti or in, in that high mountain region. You have closely tracked the snow leopard for now 30 years. So give us a sense of life in the high altitude in that extreme temperature zone and how have you tracked this very elusive animal and have started it for so long? Um, so, Ananda, you know, I have always been um, uh, very, very uh, keen on the mountains, the Himalaya. Uh, and uh, while a student at uh, the Wildlife Institute in Dehradun, I was lucky because a project on Ibex was uh, available at that time. This is in um, early 90s, uh, 1990. And um, uh, I got the chance to go to the Pin Valley National Park in Lahul Spiti, and which was a very, uh, you know, a great opportunity for me. Uh, I had been trekking for a long time in in the mountains, but uh, this gave uh, an opportunity to actually be in the Trans Himalaya, uh, an area that I have not really uh, visited uh, before that before going there. And it's it's a cold desert and. Uh, extremely low temperatures, uh, snow, uh, things that I had have, I have not uh, till then faced. But um, coming to your um, the, the original question about the lunch with the snow leopard, you know, that is an instance where uh, we uh, had a very interesting um, sighting of um, um, an Ibex group, uh, which we thought was actually chased by the snow leopard the previous day. Um, and uh, based on some, uh, you know, tracking that we did, we realized that the snow leopard was somewhere out on that slope. And this happened to be not very far from my base camp in a place called Gecha. In the morning, got up and actually looked at the place where the kill, uh, there was an ibex kill there. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, we saw the snow leopard within minutes of actually putting up the spotting scope. And um, uh, we kept looking at it and we thought that we'll go and take a cool closer look. And so we climbed up, you know, waist deep snow, uh, up that slope. And uh, we went up that slope um, opposite uh, the snow leopard. We are still about half a kilometer across a gorge. So the snow leopard was, could see us, but you know, it was nice to see that it was just not affected by our presence. And we, you know, it was like I started, I took out my notebook and started taking, you know, observations on any behavior, but it was basically resting behavior. But, you know, there were observations that I was uh, taking uh, and, you know, I was jotting down my thoughts. And uh, it was lunchtime uh, and we were actually hungry. And so, you know, uh, we had assistants there, Zampo and Chimit, and they said no issues uh, for, a climb which normally takes us, um, you know, would have taken us about 15 minutes up to half an hour through the snow. I mean, they just slid down and within minutes, they were back with, um, uh, you know, a portable stove and some Maggie and stuff. And they dug a little crevice and uh, a crater and then uh, sat there and uh, quickly cooked up uh, Maggie and some tea and stuff. And so it was a uh, fascinating feeling uh, being accepted by the snow leopard and actually sitting and um, you know, having some nice meal nicely slowly chatting among ourselves and taking observations but things have also changed the 
the sightings of snow leopards in the 80s or in the 90s were very few and far between. But now people are going on a kind of a two day, three day tour, getting photos of the snow leopard and coming back. So what's changed in this landscape? Yeah, I think there are multiple things that have changed. Uh, in very rare cases, the snow leopard population may have improved. Uh, but I think, um, you know, generations of scientists have actually now worked um, in uh, places like Skiti and uh, Ladakh. Um, you know, in Ladakh, uh, Raghu Chundavat was there, uh, and then Rodney Jackson, uh, Rinjin Bangchuk, uh, now the Snow Leopard Conservancy, the forest, the wildlife department itself. Um, and in Spiti, it was uh, our group from NCF, uh, me, Charu, and many other students who have been working there uh, over the years. So um, it has, uh, you know, one, and a lot of local people have also been working with us. Um, so in many instances, um, you know, a combination of uh, this knowledge of tracking snow leopards across the mountains, you know, complemented by um, you know, fairly extensive camera tracking has given a lot of people a sense of where to look. You know, as it is a gray ghost, I mean, that's the, that's the terminology that people normally use. Uh, but I mean, it is not a ghost, it is, it is very much there, yeah? So, uh, and um, uh, it, is, um, it is basically such a such beautiful camouflage uh, that, uh, you know, you can actually miss it out uh, just a few, you know, 10, 15 meters away from you. Uh, it's such a beautiful camouflage. Uh, so, um, I would say um, uh, science, extensive camera wrapping, extensive tracking, Plus, very importantly, uh, a large number of local people, uh, local boys and girls who naturally are able to sight much better, better than what we can. Because you know, they, are, they have trained themselves to look out for their horses and yaks way out in the, uh, on the slopes, many, many kilometers away. So uh, their sense of tracking is so good. So you know, giving this opportunity of uh, you know looking through spotting scopes, having some knowledge of uh, where to look for, um, uh, I think that's what has really uh, really changed. Uh, where uh, now uh, there is a you know fairly large number of uh, uh, people, uh, both scientists and uh, local local scientists, you can say, uh, you know, who are very well aware of uh, uh, the ways of the snow leopard. And I think that's the, the way this has really grown. And I think the market has also complemented it because a lot of people now who are keen uh, to come rough it out during winter, winter is the main time when uh, snow leopard tourism takes place um, and um, you know give fairly decent amount of money. Uh, it's a good source of income for local communities uh, also. Uh, so I think there is a kind of a sustainable mechanism which is now developing. Uh, the government, the wildlife departments, the forest departments are also playing an important role in facilitating this. <clears throat> but uh, the locals had always a very hostile relationship with snow leopard. The snow leopard used to come and take away their sheep and goats and all. So how has this changed now? As you are saying, there's a lot of friendly kind of, a lot of them have homestays, a lot of them are tour operators. So how has this attitude changed over time? Uh, people are hostile to some degree towards snow leopard, but by and large, at least in the Tibetan parts of the Indian Himalaya, the hostility is not, not very pronounced, I would say, uh, when compared to, say, other, uh, uh, in the wolf and um, uh, even now, the free-ranging dogs, the feral dogs are becoming a big issue uh, for the local livestock also. So, uh, and snow leopard does have some cultural significance for uh, them. So there is, there are some very interesting studies that students at NCF have uh, done regarding uh, these attitudes. So uh, the attitudes are not like a blanket negativity towards snow leopard. So this is, okay, one, one point that there is a, um, it differs a lot from region to region, but it's not very negative always, yeah. The hostility does come in on occasions when you know, you imagine a situation where you are a herder and you open the corral in the morning and you see all your 50 sheep and go dead. Yeah. 
and there is a snow leopard trapped in the corner. Okay, so it's like so much of your wealth is gone. And the snow leopard is also completely tired. It is like worn out uh, by, you know, the whole instance of the surplus killing. And there is a whole reason why something like this happens. Uh, it's not that the snow leopard wanted to kill all the 50 an uh, uh, animals here. I mean, they get into the corral and there is a stampede and, you know, all of, many of them die either through a bite or might just die out of uh, uh, shock or broken neck or something like that. You know, sometimes at such stages, retaliatory killing does take place because, uh, and such instances certainly have happened in the Indian Himalaya. But I would say uh, that it is not, not very high. It has never been very high, the retaliatory killing. Um, so that is uh, that has been a key thread. But you know, in both Spiti, where conservation programs have been going on and people are now beginning to benefit from uh, snow leopard, also where there is slightly better awareness of um, uh, you know government laws, the possibility of actually getting some compensation, uh, and generally cultural reasons. And especially in um, Ladakh, where uh, in Hemis National Park and many other places, there is a substantial amount of income which has now come, which, which is coming to the community directly because of the snow leopard. Yeah, so in both the cases, uh, we have noticed that, um, um, you know, there is, a, uh, there is an improvement in attitudes uh, of people towards, uh, towards snow leopard. And this certainly can be linked to, uh, you know, more engagement uh, of the conservation community with the local communities uh, and, of course, direct economic benefits that uh, people have been able to derive from snow leopard. So, you know, I very often think that, um, you know, this actually is like a textbook example of how a local stake, uh, economic stake uh, that, you know, local community, local benefits, economic benefits that the community can actually derive can almost cement the, their interest in conservation. It's not only this, and that is something that I would like to emphasize, that economic benefits is certainly very important, but we realize that the, the larger conservation ethos and ethics really needs to be also imbibed, uh, including their, you know, reviving their cultural values uh, towards nature. So let me ask you, Yashbe, snow leopard is the iconic species in that landscape, it's a very high altitude zone, but it's just not limited to the Indian Himalayas. The same animal is going to China, the same animal is going to Pakistan, and as a huge, huge range. What is your kind of guesstimate? See, uh, our snow leopard uh, states are from Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, Himachal, and Kashmir, if I'm correct. Uh, Ladakh and Kashmir now, yeah. Yeah, Ladakh and Kashmir now. So, what's your kind of guesstimate that in the Indian range has? out of the three to 7,000 figure that you're saying? Yeah, so, you know, a um, few years ago, again, a lot of our uh, scientists, we had uh, contributed a, an article where, uh, based on these density figures and uh, the, the, you know, habitat quality, stratified habitat quality, uh, we managed to get an estimate, which was uh, from about four, uh, 470 to, Maybe about 520, 25, something like that. I mean, so five, you can say 510 snow leopards uh, in India is the kind of estimate that uh, we had made in about 2016. Two other very elusive species in that landscape, which I haven't seen, I'm very fascinated about, is the Himalayan wolf or the Tibetan wolf and the Eurasian lynx. How many times have you seen these animals? And just a little tell us, our viewers and all, we are very fascinated about this. Surely, surely. So, uh, see, Tibetan wolf is something which really um, uh, is a fascinating animal. And um, uh, you also mentioned Himalayan wolf. So now studies from uh, Lacan, CCMB and WR, they are showing that, uh, you know, this, uh, that the Tibetan wolf that occurs in the Himalaya uh, can actually be um, a slightly more primitive form in a separate species or a subspecies of uh, uh, the gray wolf. Um, uh, so uh, it is already considered to be a, a subspecies of the gray, gray wolf, but they think that it is a more distinct form of, uh, uh, or maybe a distinct species itself. 
similar studies in Nepal also are kind of confirming this uh, uh, this idea. So if that is the case, uh, this actually can be a very very highly endangered species. So across, I mean, the places where I have worked in Spiti, uh, mostly uh, uh, wolves are not very common. Uh, so in all, I have seen wolves just about on about four or five occasions compared to about 15, 20 occasions or 15 occasions I have seen snow leopards. But uh, wolves are... Uh, all, this 50 years. all this in sorry? 50 years. All this in 50 yes. years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you know, it is, um, I said, this is not, uh, you know, including, uh, you know, those occasions where we actually do it uh, for an exercise of trying to find, uh, get to a, a, a snow leopard sighting uh, for tourists or something like that. Um, so I think that, like we discussed already, makes it much easier. So this is basically in the course of a study, trying to identify, trying to look for them is a little more uh, tedious, uh, uh, you know, and um, yeah, so uh, wolves are, uh, you know, they have fascinated me a lot. Um, and, you know, if I say that I'm actually more of a dog person, so they are uh, something that I really love and, uh, and fascinated. And I am very sad uh, that they are, they're actually very heavily persecuted, even in the Buddhist areas. For now, I think this might be enough. And lynx, unfortunately, I've never seen. Um, they are actually very rare, uh, very, very rare in Spiti, uh, but even in Ladakh, they're not that common. So <clears throat> while you were telling your snow leopard story, you said Ibex kill. Now, a lot of our viewers do not know what an Ibex is. And there is an array of mountain ungulates, very fascinating. We are used to the cheetah, we are used to the sambar, we are used to the barasing and the mainland, but there is a whole world of ungulates and prey species for the snow leopard in the mountains, which you have tracked and seen. So give us a sense of the biodiversity in the high altitude. Um, so first of all, you know, the Himalaya and Central Asia, these are the hub of the wild sheep and goat. These are the areas where wild sheep and goat. So interestingly, you know, um, I think all wild relatives of our livestock um, are found in this, this region. So wild sheep, we have, got in these areas, wild goats we have got, wild equids we have, and wild bovids, yeah? So we have all these species. In addition, we have got um, antelopes also uh, in these in these uh, mountain areas. Uh, but when you come into the subalpine, the forested zones, uh, you have many other species, uh, uh, such as the Himalayan thar, the goral, um, the mustier, um, and these are the actual mountain ungulates. But apart from them, uh, you do have sambar, wild pig, and others. And in Kashmir, we have uh, the hangul. Uh, but coming back into the slightly higher areas, uh, the, 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 the forest, uh, uh, the non forested uh, areas of the high Himalaya, uh, the other areas where you know, these wild uh, sheep, goat, and equids and antelopes normally occur. And we are blessed with a huge variety of uh, these species uh, you know in fact eight nine species um, uh, are just recorded of ungulates in Lata. Um, and if you go across uh, you know there are these uh, species like the wild goats which is ibex uh, himalayan ibex asiatic ibex uh, by the way there are some very interesting studies that zsi is doing on the genetics of uh, the himalayan ibex uh, again which is uh, you can leave it for now but there are some interesting findings that they are having. Uh, then we have the mark hawk, again in the forested areas in just small parts of Kashmir. Uh, then we have the two um, sheep, which is the Ladakh Puriyal, which occurs essentially along the uh, Shoyok and the Indus River in, um, uh, in India, uh, in Ladakh, and some parts of the, uh, what we call the POK. So um, uh, apart from that, we have the Ladakh, uh, sorry, the Tibetan Argali, you know, which occurs in the rolling mountains higher than where the uh, Ladakh Uriel occurs. And this is a extremely grand, uh, big sheep species. A male would stand about 115 to 20 kilos. It's a very, very big animal. I think all these animals are fairly big and uh, very grand. You should see the, 
the argan meal uh, or the markhor meal i mean most of these are very very grand uh, looking uh, animals and uh, then you have um, uh, the kyang um, the uh, you know tibetan wild lass uh, the wild yak and um, the tibetan antelope or chew which occurs essentially in the um, in the chang chenmo area where the, the problems are happening just north of pongongsu and in the dbo areas of uh, ladakh uh, in chang chenmo is the area uh, the only area where we have wild yaks also uh, in india uh, and um, uh, the one species ah, there is tibetan gazelle which again occurs in extremely small patches on the eastern ladakh and in uh, uh, sikkim also so argali and uh, kyangs also occur in sikkim um, and now um, in very small portions of uttarakhand and himachal also uh, argalis have been uh, found out uh, have been seen uh, also kyang you know so there is a uh, a distribution across the three or four states of these animals and one species that i missed is something which is neither a uh, true sheep nor a deep true goat is the blue sheep or the pardal so there is this huge uh, you know diversity of uh, these species uh, plus among the carnivores you know you have the bears the both the black and the brown bear uh, occur in these areas and see i'm not even going into the northeast uh, mountains where you know takin and other bears uh, occur. I'm not too familiar with those um, areas uh, anyway. So, um, uh, I mean, you know, given the, the way this landscape is, uh, the aridity, the cold desert that this landscape is, it's fascinating to see such a diversity of uh, these wild uh, sheep, goat, and many other animals. And it's also, um, you know, because of the way you know the different realms have kind of uh, merged in these areas the palactic the ethiopian and the oriental and the you know you can say uh, we are still talking of uh, goats and sheep there is also a way of life the pastoral way of life in the mountains which yeah. you have followed very closely you have started there are several communities which kind of yeah. are pastoral in nature um, also mm -hmm. these are also going extinct kind of thing of or kind of art or in great stress so give us a sense of how this landscape and people are adapting to each other so you know uh, i mean um, some of our studies ananda are actually showing that uh, livestock grazing uh, might actually be the the threat number one for conservation in much of these areas um, and before going into that, you know, let me quickly flag one uh, thing that you know has emerged out of uh, uh, years of re uh, research and explorations, a variety of researches across many different organizations, is that you know there are quite a few national parks and sanctuaries, but wildlife, especially in the uh, non-forested areas uh, uh, above the tree line, I mean, the Transimania are really widespread, very low densities in most places, but they are widespread. So they are not limited to national parks and sanctuaries, uh, and which basically this large interface that you have with uh, people and uh, wildlife is a is a is something that we have actually addressed, and we might uh, speak about that briefly uh, later on. But you know, uh, given the the fact that in the higher altitudes, cultivation is not very easy, uh, and if at all in areas say below 4,200 meters or so. Where cultivation still can take place uh, is only one crop uh, for three to four months. Where uh, one crop like barley or these days some cash crops like green peas and vegetables are grown. Uh, in some cases, you know, even fruits like apple are now uh, coming in. So uh, people are the, the the resident people can be either agropastoral uh, who are involved with uh, some amount of cultivation, which is very very small anyway. You know, it's like a in many of these landscapes it is less than one percent of the landscape which is cultivated uh, much lesser than one percent which is cultivated uh, but there are vast range lands which might not look like typical pastures that you see in uh, say european or central asian pictures but they are desert kind of pastures range lands uh, where the, these livestock are also able to sustain themselves along with other uh, wild ungulates that we have spoken about. Uh, but for millennia, uh, these people locally, 
have been uh, living off uh, rearing livestock, sheep, goat, yaks, horses, uh, donkeys, and hybrids of you know yaks and um, the local cows. These people are very often constrained with how many livestock they can actually keep through the long winter season. So they regulate their livestock numbers, but you know the the nomadic uh, or the transhumant uh, uh, nomads, uh, the the, the gaddis, the bakarwals, the Gujars, uh, they have evolved over the years to actually utilize the uh, both the lower foothills, uh, Shivaliks, and the lower Himalayas during the uh, winter season. So they are not constrained the way the local Ladakhis or Spitians or the high mountain people are. Uh, because they come down and they have the forests and areas for uh, sustaining their livestock. But uh, during the monsoon, they come into these high mountain, uh, mountain areas, many of which are actually free of monsoonal effects. And their uh, nutritious forage grows through the summer season, you know, June, July, August, September, June, July, August mostly. And they are able to sustain themselves uh, then rear their livestock uh, very well. There have been many places because it's a very, you know, very difficult work, you know, so they are extremely hardy and I have got very high regard for all these herding community work. Uh, but, you know, I can see that um, in many pockets, um, because of various reasons that I, I think we can avoid now, uh, there are certain pockets where the level of livestock grazing has actually increased tremendously, especially uh, due to the migrant uh, livestock which are coming from the foothills. Uh, and that has caused a lot of pressure. And some of our studies are showing that, say, certain parts of uh, Upper Chandra Valley in Himachal Pradesh uh, have almost no ibex left, very, very few. And you know, days of camera trapping have yielded no uh, wildlife sighting in, uh, uh, in in those areas. And Apart from this, uh, is there is hunting pressure? Is there is poaching threat? So you know, poaching threat um, uh, is not widespread uh, um, across the area and uh, you know if you really look at the the the, the high altitudes you know, they are mostly in Ladakh, Lahul Spiti, Himachal Pradesh and in Sikkim. So these are essentially Buddhist areas where uh, you know Poji has never been very high. Uh, they, there was some amount of traditional hunting in some communities but it has never been very high. Uh, but some of the other areas um, uh, poaching does uh, take place. Um, but, you know, and actually in some pockets of maybe Jammu and uh, Kashmir and uh, places like Lahul and the Middle Himalaya, uh, the level of poaching can be actually high. Uh, but they are unassessed uh, as of now. Uh, I think species like, you know, Goral, Himalayan Thar, which occur in the forested areas, must deer, of course, these are under, um, you know, great threat of uh, uh, poaching. In the 30 years that you have tracked all these species, how much climate change is affecting the landscape? Because we constantly hear mountains, glaciers are melting or retreating kind of thing, and there is <coughs> great pressure on biodiversity because of climate change? What have you noticed? What I have noticed is mostly in terms of, um, you know, the changes in, um, in, in the precipitation patterns through winter and summer, you know? And this is something which, you know, conversations with the local people also, uh, you know, confirm that uh, uh, this is, that these changes are really happening. And in short, you know, what is typically happening across most of the areas is, uh, that the winter precipitation in form of snow is very often reduced. Uh, but late winter or spring snows are increasing. In many of these so-called rain shadow areas, we are actually having, um, you know, somewhat monsoonal effect in July, August. And you might have heard of the 2010, um, you know, uh, rain in, yes. um, you know, and floods in Leh and many areas of Ladakh. But they were... You know, attributed to cloud bursts, but some of the, the, the instance of these cloud bursts is actually increasing. And very often, you know, I feel that, you know, these areas are probably getting warmer uh, through May, June, and the low pressure in these areas is actually uh, higher. So it is probably sucking in the monsoonal, you know, clouds a little more across the, the Himalaya. Uh, and 
you know, we are seeing more and more uh, instances of extreme events through the summer season. But I spoke about the, you know, uh, the spring snowfall. See, the, normally what happens is that in areas where snow falls through December, January, uh, and February, February is usually the coldest month in many of these places, you know, the snow accumulates and it kind of forms a kind of continuous layer of uh, uh, snow of different levels of compaction, which starts melting slowly. And I think a lot of it percolates um, and it goes into the aquifers. But late uh, winter or spring snows, they are much, they're not powdery, they, they are wet, uh, like the local people say, uh, and they melt very fast. And when they melt very fast, they actually cause a lot of erosion and flash floods. So a lot of times, you know, if April, May, June, um, many of these places are suffering from flash floods. So this is another thing which is happening. I have not noticed it and I am not really aware of uh, any study which has shown so far, but the, the local communities claim that because of, you know, lesser accumulation of snow in winter, the, uh, their pastures are not good enough. The, the pastures might need moisture during the spring season, but that is a time when either there is no snow or the snow I mean, is quickly melting and it's not spreading into the vital pastures and which is uh, possibly causing um, increasing aridity and uh, this lack of moisture in um, early spring in, in many of the places um, is uh, not very good for pastures like is what people are saying and the rains that happen in July August are actually too late for pastures to region uh, I mean, grow properly and because by August, actually, senescence starts setting in. But the habitat is also changing, man. Before I let you go, Yashvir, I want to ask because our mainland development is like soon spoiling a lot of places. Like I can't recognize Lay Town when I in recent years, what I've seen 10 years or 20 years back, even Skaza in Spiti. So huge changes have taken place, and there are problems of garbage and other other issues. Yeah. What lies ahead? What do you see in the near future? People are really worried. So, uh, you know, Lay uh, has certainly uh, changed a lot, but I think Lay still remains one of my favorite hill stations because it's still far better than the other hill stations uh, uh, in, in India. So, um, but yes, there are changes which are taking place and mass tourism is an issue. And after 2010, uh, you know, after the three idiots, uh, uh, Ladakh is actually facing a huge, uh, you know, surge of uh, tourists who come in there. So, you know, from barely about 50,000 um, uh, in about 2010, it has shot up to over three lakhs uh, a year uh, in the recent years. and uh, it is stressing out the, the water availability and you know, mo most of this is concentrated in a few pockets. So as far as, um, you know, sudden development is concerned, I, uh, it is a matter of concern. But I also see that, you know, the new um, uh, Union Territory in Ladakh, uh, if you take that example, they are uh, very keen to actually, uh, you know, going for the carbon neutral model and are very conscious about uh, you know, stepping back and and looking at tourism uh, as a, uh, you know as a certainly as an important means of local economy, improving uh, local economy, but making it uh, much more friendly. Also, they are very conscious about uh, you know certain things like water and energy. Um, also, you know, I'll quickly touch upon this, uh, uh, Ananda, that you know both from government and civil society, there is a lot of interest now in the high altitudes. Uh, academic institutions, uh, civil society organizations, the ministry, the governments, the forest departments, they're all now actually quite enthused about snow leopard conservation and are convinced that, you know, protected area-based conservation is not the way ahead. So there are multiple now models, uh, like the ministry's project snow leopard, for example, uh, which, uh, you know, we all contributed to uh, develop and are helping out with now, uh, that looks at landscape level conservation, which will be much more inclusive, uh, where, uh, you know, all these issues uh, can be 
uh, handled and are being handled uh, in a much more uh, participatory manner. So one so quick last question that what's keeping you busy? What's your latest or new project with the Snow Leopard? I, Just tell us a bit. <laughs> okay, so see, I, I worked uh, um, uh, I'm in uh, the Nature Conservation Foundation, but I uh, worked um, uh, in also uh, helped out the Snow Leopard Trusts India program for many years. Uh, and this year onwards, I'm kind of um, uh, developing something on my own. So there are a lot of things that uh, I was able to lead over the years from, you know, just sheer exploration, which is lovely, uh, into areas which are not very well known, to understanding species like the Ibex and Ladakh Kuriyang, to understanding problems like, um, uh, the, you know, uh, the people wildlife conflict uh, and trying to find solutions to that uh, to actually then um, you know upscale this to uh, look at conservation models uh, in small clusters of villages uh, and with other stakeholders and then you know scale it up to uh, like I just mentioned uh, at state or national level um, working towards um, you know conservation planning and uh, you can say strategies or policies Thank you, Dr. Bhatnagar. Wonderful having you on Planet Outlook. And as in the mountains, the same to sign of Julie. Julie, <laughs> thank you so much.